midst of a COVID kind of crazy world, God is working. The gospel is going forth. Uh, we're seeing more and more opposition to the gospel, but God is really working. And it's not a time to run and hide. It's not a time to hide your light under a bushel, but to shine the light of Jesus Christ around the world because people are looking for hope. There's no hope outside of Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. Uh, just to tell you real quick, I was coming in, I was driving in from Rapid City last night, and I stopped at the Flying J to get a bottle of water and use the restroom. And uh, I saw a girl sitting there, and I gave her a gospel track. And when I came back out, she was reading the track. And so I thought, this is a great opportunity to share the gospel. And so I started sharing with her, and I said, could I just pray for you? And she said, yes. And I was able to pray with her, pray for her. And when I was done praying, she was crying. And so I talked to her some more and ended up praying with her again. And she just literally had tears streaming down her face. And she told me that yesterday morning she woke up and she actually was thinking about committing suicide yesterday. And I thought, what a divine appointment. And so um, I was actually just in Miami and somehow I, I lost my Bible in my car and I couldn't find my Bible. So when I was in the hotel room, I took the Gideon Bible. And so... Um, I said, do you have a Bible to this girl? And she said, no, I don't. And so I went in my car, and I find my Bible right away. And then I thought, well, I got that Gideon Bible, and I gave her the Gideon Bible. And I just thought, Lord, what a, how amazing how God is working. And, you know, people are searching all over the world right now, and even in our own country. People are realizing that their hope is not in our government. The hope is in nothing except the only hope is Jesus Christ. Amen? The only hope for the whole world is Jesus. So I got saved in, at the age of 18 in Glen Rock, Wyoming, at a Don Francisco concert back in uh, September 8th, 1980. And so I've been a Christian for 40 years. And so I got saved. And, and uh, my dad thought I'd lost my mind. He thought I was just crazy when I get born again. All I want to do is talk about Jesus. And I'm just reading the Bible constantly. I could not get enough of the Word of God. But I was reading the Bible one day, and I read the Great Commission. And it says, Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I've commanded you, and lo, I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. And when I read that scripture, it hit me in my face like, Pat, you have a part to play in helping get the gospel around the world. And it was like, okay, Lord, what am I to do? And not long after I got saved, I actually, somebody gave me a copy of God Smuggler by Brother Andrew. And if you haven't read that book, I encourage you to read that book. So I started re reading about the persecuted church around the world. And I got on open doors mailing lists and started praying for the persecuted church, praying for pastors and evangelists who spent many years in prison for their faith. Little did I know, years later, I would be meeting many of those pastors and evangelists and was able to deliver Bibles to them and bring encouragement to them. So what a blessing God is, has been just serving the Lord and getting Bibles around the world. We just passed the 2 million Bible mark. Just passed it. We're about 2.1 million Bibles that we've distributed around the world. And we give the Bible free of charge. We do not sell Bibles. We believe that the Bible should be freely available to everybody who wants it. Amen? And that the Bible should be free. And so that's what we've been doing. So um, I went back in um, when I was in Bible school, I went on an outreach to China and the Southeast Asia. We went to five countries in four weeks. One of the things we did was we smuggled Bibles into China. Not to tell you, I had Bibles underneath my clothes. I was with uh, two friends, and I had Bibles in my suitcases. And we're going through, and the girl got right through, but the guy got busted, and then I got busted. But my job was to go in the bathroom and get the Bibles that were underneath my clothes and the Bibles that made it through and repack them. Now, at that time, uh, Shenzhen, which today is a city of 15 million people, Shenzhen did not exist 36 years ago. It was not even, it was just a little podunk town. And so I had to go in the bathroom, and I'm in this stall, and, and I'm like, I have to keep the bags off the floor because the floor is messy. And so I'm like trying to balance these bags on my feet, uh, 80 degrees out, 90% humidity. I'm just dripping with sweat. I'm as nervous as can be, and I'm taking these Bibles off from my, under my clothes and, and putting them in these bags and repacking them, and I'm nervous. I'm as nervous. I thought my passport was going to fall out of my pocket and fall down the toilet, and I'd be stuck in China the rest of my life. And I'm nervous and everything else, and I'm like, Lord, I think this is what I'm created to do. 
is get Bibles around the world. And I was so excited. And so we've been carrying Bibles uh, for over, it's been like 36 years now, carrying Bibles into closed countries. So years ago, I had the privilege of meeting this man, the second one from the right, Pastor Alan Yuen. Brother Andrew wrote a book about him. Uh, when I met him, he was 89 years old. He spent tw- 22 years in prison for his faith in Jesus Christ. 22 years. He pastored a church in Beijing of 1,500 people. Every year in August, they would baptize 400 new believers. And so Brother Andrew wrote a book about him. I got to meet this guy, and I can't tell you how humbling it was to meet a man who spent 22 years in prison for his faith in Jesus Christ. And so I was asking him, I said, Pastor, how do we as a church in America help the Chinese church? He said, first of all, please pray for us. We have a lot of persecution, a lot of our leaders in prison. He said, but we're now 9% Christian. The government cannot stop us now. And he second of all, bring us Bibles. We're desperate for Bibles. Well, when an 89-year-old man who spent 22 years in prison says he wants Bibles, he's like, yes, sir, when and where do you want them? And so we've been carrying Bibles in for over 30 years. Uh, three years ago, I was stopped my second time and was kicked, not my second time being stopped, but second time actually being kicked out of China. I've been kicked out twice now for bringing Bibles in. Uh, I cannot go back to China for about six or seven more years. Um, but the church is growing. A lot of opposition, though, to the gospel in China. So this was a privilege, an amazing privilege I had a couple of years ago to actually hold in my hands hand-copied New Testaments. Hand-copied New Testaments in mainland China. Uh, people who were transla- you know, transcribing scriptures, probably by candlelight. You know, that's how hungry they are for the Word of God in China. Even when I lived in northwest China among the Uyghur people over 30 years ago, we ran out of Gospels of Mark, and so people were hand-copying the Gospel of Mark. Because they wanted the word of God. And so that's how hungry they are for the word of God. Um, Chinese government has been sent spies to infiltrate Chinese churches in Europe, especially those working in China or churches with Chinese people. They gather information about any work in China or among Chinese. Uh, this President Xi is determined to destroy the church in China. We need to pray for President Xi that God will save him or get him out of the way because this man is determined to destroy the church and bring the whole world under communism. We need to be praying. Uh, Despite what the president says, uh, China is a threat to America, and they are not our friends. They are not our friend, and they are not friends of the church of Jesus Christ. Okay, so if Chinese churches sponsor meetings overseas, it's Hong Kong, Malaysia. They've broken the law and be fined uh, 25,000 euros, about $30,000. So I know a couple of years ago, there was a worship conference in Hong Kong, and they were threatened. The believers were threatened from China. If they came across into Hong Kong, they could be fined $2,500 just for coming to that worship service. But 13,000 people came anyway. They were determined. And to see these people worship the Lord when they had freedom, because in China you can't gather like this. This is illegal, okay? And so now because of the new restrictions in China, only three or four people can gather together without being arrested. Uh, 270 million cameras watching people at all times. It's just insane what's going on. Um, it reported a new communist translation, as Pastor Darrell said, uh, coming out next year. The book of Revelation is taken out. Uh, They're saying there's more than one God. President Xi is one of them that needs to be worshipped. And they're changing the moral laws of Jesus. They said that Jesus stoned the woman caught in adultery. So they're changing the word of God, trying to turn the Chinese people against Jesus Christ. And so this man is very, very evil. We need to pray that God will bring him down. Uh, tens of thousands of Bibles used by house church groups have been confiscated and many destroyed. Many times they get Bibles, they burn the Bibles now. It's very difficult to get scriptures inside mainland China now. Um, you know, we heard about one pastor who went to Amity Press, and he, he told the people in the province, I'm going to get some Bibles. So pastors gave him some money to go buy Bibles from Amity Press, the largest pre- printing press in the world. He went and bought a 1,000 Bibles. They followed him home. When he got home, they tied him up to the ceiling, and they beat him for eight hours, and they took the Bibles away from him. So there's opposition to the Word of God in China. China is not uh, the great country that that the media is trying to portray. It's not a good country. It's not a good country at all. But the Chinese church is a wonderful church. They love Jesus Christ. 
and they're working in spite of the persecution. <coughs> in some parts of China, it's very difficult for foreigners to deliver Bibles. That's, that's proof. I have proof of that because I know I was kicked out for carrying 22 Bibles. At one point, I had eight military, armed military police watching me as though I was some drug kingpin or mass murderer, eight guards, and all I had was 22 study Bibles for the pastors. And so they kicked me out of China. There I am on the, uh, on the left, on the bottom, uh, just loading up Bibles to take into China. I've been kicked out of China, so I can't go back, but we have ways. We're trying to help the Chinese church even now. It's very difficult, but, but God is still making a way. Um, in many parts of China, young Christians have been arrested, brainwashed, and forced to sign statements in which they renounce their belief in Christ and declare they're atheists. They're even telling Christian kids they have to say that their parents brainwashed them and they no longer believe in Jesus Christ in order to go to school. It's horrible. This man is determined. He wants to stop the church. But we know that God said his, the gates of hell will not prevail against his church. Amen? Amen. Amen. So the people are standing up, and they're actually, as Pastor Darrell said, there's over 100 pastors. This was a couple of years ago I'd heard about this. Over 110 pastors had signed an edict saying, we will not bow. We will not bow to the communist government. We are going to serve Jesus Christ. We don't care what you do to us. We're going to follow Jesus Christ. And I believe as Christians in America, we need to make the same commitment to Jesus, that we're not going to bow. We are not going to bow. We're not going to put the government first. We're going to always put Jesus Christ first. Amen? Because that's the goal, is to get us to bow to their, their government. They're saying that actually in the churches now, they have pictures of Chairman Mao and President Xi on their altars, just like they did in Nazi Germany with, with Hitler's picture on the altars. It's, it's just the same thing. The message is love the Communist Party, number one, and number two is to love the church. But it's their church, the government church. It's not God's church. Okay, these are some believers uh, receiving Bibles around the world. Uh, this one, this man on the right, is actually from Laos. We cannot get enough Bibles into the country of Laos. I started going to Laos almost 30 years ago. In 1994, there were actually uh, 400 Christians. Sorry, 1991. 1991, there was 400 Christians Today, there's over a quarter of a million believers in Laos. I mean, the church is growing so fast, we cannot get enough Bibles in there. And we started carrying them in in roller bags and, and duffel bags, and God has blessed us. We've been able to send in semi-loads of Bibles into a communist country. It's only the grace of God. So over the years, there's been over 130,000 Bibles we've sent into Laos. We're in the process of printing 30,000 more, and they asked us if we would provide 100,000 New Testaments because they want to see the church grow to 400,000 by 2023. And so we're working on printing those, getting those all together, and sending them in as well. But the church is growing. People are hungry for the truth of Jesus Christ. They see communism doesn't work. They see that Buddhism and, and Islam and, and all these other religions, they don't work. And there are people around the world are questioning and saying, what is the truth? Bring us the truth. And we want to hear about Jesus Christ. This up here um, in the upper left is actually, uh, they're training up 600 young people in Vietnam to carry the gospel throughout Vietnam. 600 young people they're training up to do the work of God. Uh, so we're able to get Bibles to them. We cannot keep up in, in Vietnam. The church is growing so fast. Um, this is a lady we work with in Burma. This is Miss Emerald. Uh, Miss Emerald is 89 years old. She has 147 orphans in her orphanage in Burma, Myanmar, which you know is going through a lot of trouble right now. The Burmese military is, is slaughtering the people. Miss Emerald's grandmother started the orphanage in 1905, and over the years they've helped over 1,000 kids. Miss Emerald is an amazing lady. Uh, we wrote a book about her recently, and I got to talk to her, and, and I've known her for probably 20 years. And just precious, precious lady. And uh, we had a lady from Powell wrote the book about her. And so I took the manuscript over, and I said, Miss Emerald, is this the way it is? She's 89 years old. Her mind is so clear. She knows all the kids' names in the orphanage. And she can tell you about those kids, where they came from. You can tell you the history. It's amazing. She's rattling off dates about her sisters when they went to high school, when they graduated, college. I mean, it's incredible. Her mind is very, very sharp. 
And I say, Miss Emerald, is it this way? And she, she grabbed me by the arm. She says, no, honey, it wasn't that way. It was this way. And so I'd have to change the manuscript, you know. And just precious lady. But this woman has walked by faith like a George Mueller and just trusted God for all these, for, to take care of all these kids. She said, I'm, I never married, but God made me a mother to over 100 kids. And she said that widows would come to her gate and she would give the food away, all the food they had in the orphanage. She'd give it away, and the kids would say, Mommy, don't give our food away. Don't give our food away. She said, It's okay. Jesus will take care of us. And she said it never failed. The very next day, God would send somebody with as much or more food than she gave away the day before. And just trusting God all these years to provide for over a 1,000 kids. Just amazing lady and just so humble, so sweet and full of the love of Jesus. Um, she said that during the Japanese occupation, there wasn't any food. And so her and her uncle, he had a double barrel shotgun and she had a single barrel shotgun. She said she was a pretty good shot and they would shoot birds and rabbits and squirrels and stuff like that to put food on the table to feed the orphans. And she said one day the Americans, the bombers were coming in to run the Japanese out. And she said, we saw this bombers coming in. She said, my uncle and I hid underneath this tree. And she said, they dropped 13 bombs as one of them was headed right toward the church. And she said, my uncle and I just started praying, and the bomb blew up in the air and never even touched the church. And just, I mean, just the simple faith of this lady is just amazing. And she's just so humble. She just loves Jesus. And she said, what do I do? God brings these kids to my door. I can't turn them away. And so she has 147 orphans. Uh, these are just some of the kids. This is not all of them, but this is a big chunk of them, the kids there. And she just prays, prays in the food, and God provides. And so we've been able to get monthly support to her now and, and just to take a lot of pressure off. Unfortunately, she was cheated out of her property by a Chinese businessman. And so she was supposed to leave the orphanage when this man took her property from her. Um, but they got to stay, and so they, they get to stay until she passes away. So we've been able to buy land, and we're building a new orphanage for her and for all the kids out in the countryside. So it's just amazing. We want her to know that the kids will be taken care of after she passes away. Uh, this is in Laos. These are the kids up in the mountains. Very, very poor villages, many of them, uh, no electricity. And yet they are so hungry for the gospel. It's amazing how fast the gospel is growing there. Um, we had a team a little over a year ago go into northern Laos with 1,200 Bibles. And they delivered them to a pastor who had spent 13 years in prison for his faith. And when they brought the Bibles, he just broke down and started to cry. He said, thank you. He said, if you didn't bring Bibles to us, we could not get Bibles. We would not have the word of God. But he said while he was in prison, he led several young men to the Lord, discipled them, they went out and planted 63 churches. He said, we need 7,000 more Bibles for the new believers. Can you get us more Bibles? We can't keep up. The church just keeps growing so fast around the world because people realize their only hope is Jesus Christ. Uh, this is just some, some ways in, in Laos. Uh, sometimes we have to take motorboats and that to get across the rivers, uh, going into remote areas. What we've been targeting is 1,100 villages that have no gospel witness, no churches, no gospel witness. We've been to 500 villages already of those 1,100. We're trying to reach 600 more. Hopefully, the restrictions will be released soon as we can start traveling to Laos again. But we've had teams that have actually gone into these villages, actually had teams arrested. Uh, two teams actually went to prison in Laos for three days. They went into prison. Uh, one guy, when they weren't looking, he smuggled his Bible, into the prison with him. I said, what was it like having the Bible in the prison? He said, the word of God never tasted sweeter. The word of God never tasted sweeter. And so we're getting the Bibles in, but he, in that prison, the shortest sentence was two years. The longest was 10. So here's a guy from Montana thinking, Lord, I could be in prison here for two to 10 years. Wow, Lord. And he, he said he really struggled for like three days. Finally, he just surrendered. He said, okay, Lord, if that's what you have for me, I'll stay as long as you want. And so um, about an hour after he surrendered, they were released from prison. But he said they were able to share the gospel with some Chinese ladies. One of the guys snuck back into Laos and actually tossed a Bible over the wall in the prison <laughs> so this lady could get a Bible. So you, sometimes you have to do crazy things for Jesus. Amen? Amen. 
you know. I, th- I think the days of complacent Christianity is over. I, th- I think it's done. I, if you can't walk the fence anymore. It's either you're in or you're out. You know, you've got to make a decision. And I think that God is calling his church to rise up. He's calling his church to stand up and, and be a bold witness for Jesus. Here's some of the kids in the villages in Laos. Okay, Venezuela. As you know what's going on in Venezuela, Venezuela has fallen apart. Venezuela used to be one of the best economies in the world. Like three, four years ago, it was one of the strongest economies in South America. And they have just literally destroyed Venezuela. Literally destroyed it. And so um, we're just hearing stories of the power being off for like a week at a time. No gasoline. Um, you know, it's just incredible what's happening. It's just the country's falling apart. But by the grace of God, in the last two years, two and a half years, actually we have right now in route to Venezuela 100,000 more Bibles. So in the last two and a half years, it'll be 330,000 Bibles we've been able to put into Venezuela. And the people are so hungry for the gospel. The head of the customs saw the Bibles and said, there's no greater gift that you can give the people of Venezuela than the hope of Jesus Christ. And he's letting Bibles through the customs. So we just found out last week we have permission now to start sending medical supplies and start sending food into Venezuela. So we're going to start sending containers in, trying to help them. We have a container ready to go out of the office that's been going to Honduras to send food into Honduras. They've had really bad problems with uh, hurricanes and their crops being destroyed. We also have, by the grace of God, we have three 40-foot containers headed to Honduras with 120,000 Bibles, 120,000 Bibles. In, Ven- in Honduras, the schools are wide open. Pastors can go into the public schools, can preach the gospel in the public schools and give altar calls in the schools. So kids are turning to Jesus, and we want to give those kids all a Bible because every morning before they start school, they read the Bible for 15 minutes. So we feel like it's a great opportunity to reach more people with the gospel. Here they are giving out Bibles on the streets. Uh, it's just amazing what God is doing. There's some churches that are giving out Bibles. People are hungry for the Word of God. It says the Bible's being delivered in there, and just it's amazing what God is doing. We heard about one uh, lady in a village, and her daughter came to her. She said, Mommy, Jesus said Bibles are coming today. She said, No, honey. We live in a remote village in the mountains. Nobody ever comes here. She's, Mommy, Jesus said a new truck is coming with Bibles today. She's, Honey, that was not God. And she said, Mommy, Jesus said Bibles are coming today. So this lady was going to deliver the Bibles with the truck driver, with a brand new truck. They got lost, ended up right in front of that lady's house with a truckload of Bibles. (laughs) So God is working in Venezuela in the midst of it. I wish I could show it to you, but I actually got a video last week of in the prisons. They're giving out Bibles in the prisons. And in this prison yard, the whole prison yard is full of these men on their, on their faces. They're on their faces crying out for revival, repentance and revival to come to Venezuela. I mean, the whole prison yard is just full of hundreds of men on their faces asking God to send revival. It's amazing. You know, I know even in China, uh, one church, every Saturday, they prayed for revival for America for six hours every Saturday, prayed for revival to come to America. You know, isn't that amazing? Christians around the world are praying for us. So we need to be praying for people around the world and doing what we can to help strengthen the church because God is at work. Uh, pastor giving out more Bibles. We can't keep up. I mean, the church is growing so fast around the world. We keep just getting scriptures to them, printing Bibles. And, and we print them in, in Minsk, Belarus, and we print them at rock bottom prices, uh, $3.20 for a hardcover New King James Bible. I mean, you can't, in the States, that would be at least $10. And we're printing them mass quantities to get them to people, send them right into containers. You know, if we can't go in with teams, we carry them in, we send them in by containers, whatever we can to do to help. This is actually a bunch of prisoners in the prison getting a load of Bibles. And they're just so grateful for the Word of God, so grateful and so hungry for the truth of Jesus Christ. 
Um, to tell you real quick, I was just in Cuba probably uh, five weeks ago. I've been going to Cuba for almost 30 years, carrying Bibles in. Uh, even before the trade embargo was lifted from the U.S., I would fly to uh, Jamaica. I've flown from Central America, from Canada, tried to, every way I, we could to get into Cuba. In Cuba, the average family of four makes about 18 to $20 a month. 18 to $20 a month. Their monthly rations per person is five pounds of rice, eight ounces of beans, five eggs, a half a chicken leg, a pound of sugar, and a pound of cooking oil. That's their monthly ration per person. And they get one dinner roll per person per day. Okay? That's if they have the rations. So the, the rations for a family is $3.50. It's going up to $25 a month. And the families make 18 to $20 a month. They cannot afford their rations. Uh, my friend Randy, um, he's head pastor we work with. He has connections with over 200 churches. And so we have support for 250 pastors every month that we're taking in support, $25 a month to help those churches. Um, but Pastor Randy's wife, she got pregnant a couple years ago, and she had diabetes with her pregnancy. So she was in the hospital for four months. Four months in, commun- in communist Cuba. They had to bring water and food to her twice a day because the water in the hospital is not safe to drink. She said they brought soup to her the day before. There was a worm swimming in her soup. Okay? We went to the, the maternity hospital. Elevator doesn't work. We had to walk up to the fourth floor. Um, the head nurse was lighting up her cigarette when we got there. Six ladies sharing one bathroom, and Randy said, you don't want to go in the bathroom. The cockroaches are very, very big. I mean, just unbelievable. That's their maternity hospital. And so we had to actually smuggle into Cuba her syringes so she could give herself insulin three times a day. And so we had to smuggle these syringes in. She said, I have to be very careful. I don't want to bend the needle because we need to reuse these syringes. Um, when I was just there, we brought medical supplies in because they have no medicine in the country. No medicine. Even their best hospitals, they can't even get aspirin in them. Okay? So this Dr. Pablo that we know said, would you bring us surgical supplies? We need surgical supplies. We need medicine, whatever you can bring us. So we had all this medical supplies. We had about $30,000 in cash to help the churches. And so we got stopped in the customs. We were there for two hours in the customs, two hours in immigration, so four hours in the airport. Okay? So they went through our bags. They saw the surgical instruments, and the, the guy said, we have to take your medical supplies. I said, please, please, don't take the medicine. Please, please. He said, sir, you can keep the pills. You just can't have the surgical supplies. So um, I had two, box, two bottles of amoxicillin. There's no antibiotics in Cuba. I had a 1,000 tablets of amoxicillin and gave them to the doctor, and he was so excited. 30 minutes later, he had a phone call. Do you have any antibiotics? He said, I just got some. The guy said, can I come and get 21 tablets from you? I mean, they have nothing in Cuba. It's unbelievable. And they said the government, they realized that they've run out of food. They don't have enough food to feed 11 million people on the island because Venezuela's collapsed. Now they can't get the food they need for, for the Cuban people. And so we're just working on trying to get more supplies in there. Uh, God is blessed. We actually are setting up a farm. We, one of the pastors got use of a farm, 160-acre farm. He gets to use it for 30 years for free. They used to have uh, 200 dairy cattle. And our Terry cows. And so um, just recently, we were able to give him money. He bought 17 dairy cows. Not to tell you, I was never excited about pregnant cows before, but nine of the cows are pregnant. And I'm very happy to report <laughs> that nine pregnant cows. <laughs> I never thought I'd be excited about pregnant animals before, but I am excited. They're buying pigs. They're buying chickens. We're doing all we can to build up this farm, uh, getting seeds in there, trying to help build up the farm, plant fruit trees, so we can help the, the Cubans, the Cuban church. But you know, the thing about the Cuban church is they work together. And these people, they love Jesus, and they love the Word of God, and they help each other. If I have two shirts and you need one, they they share with each other. And it's amazing when you go down there because the people, you give them even a pair of reading glasses, and they break down and start to cry. They're so grateful for any help that you give them. 
um, they ran out of soap and shampoo and no, no detergents. And so they didn't have any toothpaste either. So I'd brought a lot of this in my bags. But what do you do? I mean, it's two of us bringing supplies in, two 50-pound suitcases each for 11 million people. It's like, Lord, what do you do? You know, And so they would give somebody a bar of soap, and people break down and start to cry when they got a bar of soap or a, a tube of toothpaste. You know, We have it so good in America. I mean, I know it's tough with COVID. I know it's a pain in the neck, but we still have it very good. Randy, Randy's wife, his mother-in-law, went to, um, she went to the, the uh, ration store to get some pork for New Year's because they have a big family meeting on, or family dinner on New Year's Eve. She was four days in line waiting to get a pork roast. Four days in line. People are now sleeping in line in the villages so they don't lose their place in line because it takes them days to get up to the front. We saw 150 people waiting in line to get a quart of cooking oil. It's just unbelievable. But the Christians are sharing what they have with the other people. And they're sharing the gospel and they're telling them it's because of Jesus Christ. That's why we share stuff with you. This, they asked us, could we bring some medicine for a lady with high blood pressure? Because she could not find that medicine in Cuba. So I couldn't get it in the States. So we had a, a, a lady that works with us from Mexico. She got it in Mexico. She brought it in the U.S. I took it back down and took it through Panama City in Panama and then flew back into Cuba, flew into Cuba with this medicine for this lady. And we went to take it to her, and Jenny said, share the gospel with her. And I said, you know, look how much God loves you, that he would work it out, that we would find out you needed this. We couldn't get it, but we talked to a lady we know in Mexico. She brought the medicine to us. We brought it by way of Panama City into Cuba and got it through the customs. And I said, that's how much God loves you, that he sent his son, Jesus Christ, to die on the cross for you. And this woman just started crying. And it was like five months' supply. And the lady said, well, how much do we owe you? And I said, nothing. We're Christians. We're here to share. Because God has blessed us. We want to bless you. And I believe that as we as Christians, as we share more and more with people, because our world is hoarding. They want to take more and more for themselves. It's all about themselves. But as Christians are generous, as we share, it speaks to the world. Because we care about them, we love them, and we're not hoarding for ourselves. God will take care of us. God's taken care of Miss Emerald and a thousand orphans all these years. God will take care of us. We don't need to be afraid of what the world's afraid of. Amen? We just need to trust God. So, okay, so in Pakistan, unfortunately, there's a lot of kids living on the streets in Pakistan. A lot of kids, over a million orphans on the streets. In Pakistan, and they're very vulnerable, very, very vulnerable, being taken advantage of. So I felt like, let's help. Let's set up a home. So we set up a home about a year and a half ago called Safe Haven. This is the home. And um, this is the pastor we work with, the second one from the left, Pastor Azim. Azim is from um, Pakistan. He grew up in an orphanage, speaks Urdu. He's an evangelist there. His wife is named Clara. Clara's from Colorado. And I've known Clara and her family for over 20 years. I called them and I said, do you know of anybody in Pakistan working to rescue kids off the streets? They said, we don't know of anybody. But God spoke to our hearts three months ago that we're supposed to move back to Pakistan and set up a children's home and start rescuing kids. I'm like, okay, let's do it. So now we have 15 kids and we're hoping to get a bigger facility where we can have 100 kids that we want to rescue off the streets. But Pastor Azim has been amazing to help us. He's given out, I think, 50,000 Bibles in Pakistan. And people are just, they're tired of Islam. They're tired of all the terrorism. They're tired of all the violence. And they're saying, what is the truth? And so they're opening up the gospel. Years ago, we had um, a man that was a Taliban soldier. He got a Bible. He read the Bible. He got saved. And he's given out the Bible to 500 more Uh, Taliban soldiers so God is changing even terrorists they're coming to faith in Jesus Christ and sharing the gospel with others and so I believe we're living exciting times amen this is not a time to be afraid to live in fear but a time to to live in faith and trust God because God wants to do amazing things 
So these are some of the kids that have been rescued. Uh, that's Azim and Claire over there, and some of the kids they've brought in. I mean, these kids have been through terrible things, terrible things that they've been through. Kids, even at Miss Emeralds, have been through horrible stuff, have been in villages where their families were killed, their parents were killed. But those kids wake up at 6 o'clock in the morning, they read their Bibles, and they pray for the soldiers that killed their parents. It's just amazing. Those kids just love Jesus, and it's just amazing. And so we're seeing God change, change even these kids in Pakistan and giving them hope that they never, they would never have had. I mean, growing up on the streets, the streets is not a good thing anywhere, but especially in Pakistan. So some of the kids are learning how to play guitar. They're actually using the Bible as textbook. They have homeschool, and they're teaching them uh, starting in Genesis, starting the creation account. These kids have never heard about the creation account because in public schools, they teach them evolution. And so these kids are hearing about creation, and it's just amazing to see God get a hold of these kids and change these kids. Yeah, they are working there. Um, they even have a dog. They asked, could we get a dog? I'm like, get a dog. I don't care. And so, so they have like a family environment, and they said, you know, we have 15 kids, but we'd like to have 100 kids. So Claire and Azim have three kids of their own, and then they're blending those with these 15 kids they've rescued off the streets, and they want to bump it up to 100 kids. And we're just excited because we see God working around the world. This picture of them all. Yeah. So that's it for my slides. Um, I just want to say I really appreciate this church. I appreciate your prayers and support. We're getting out Bibles more and more around the world. Uh, we've even found ways to get stuff into North Korea, uh, just trying to help the church there. We've sent Bibles into Iran. We're just trying to help reach more and more people with the gospel. And just seeing the hunger for God's word is just is just amazing to me. Um, when I got saved 40 years ago, I made a commitment to the Lord that I would spend at least an hour in the, in the Word and prayer daily. And so I've been doing that for 40 years. And I tell you, I'm so grateful for God's Word because God's Word washes my mind. You know, from all the garbage we get in this world, in America, it's all about us. Everything is about us and my personal happiness and, and everything else. And that's a lie. When I open the Bible... I'm reminded it's not about me. It's all about God and what are his plans and his purposes and how do I be a part of what he wants to do. So this morning I want to share a little bit from 2 Timothy, starting in chapter uh, uh, chapter 1, starting verse 1. Paul says, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by the will of God, according to the promise of life in Christ Jesus, to Timothy, my beloved son, Grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord. I thank God whom I serve with a clear conscience the way my forefathers did, as I constantly remember you in my prayers night and day, longing to see you even as I recall your tears, so I may be filled with joy. For I am mindful of the sincere faith within you, which first dwelt in your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice, and I am sure is in you as well. For this reason, I remind you to kindle afresh the gift of God which is in you through the laying on of my hands. For God has not given us a spirit of timidity or of fear, but of power and love and discipline. Therefore, do not be ashamed of the testimony of, of our Lord or me, his prisoner, but join with me in suffering for the gospel according to the power of God, who has saved us and called us with a holy calling. Not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which has granted us in Christ Jesus from all eternity, but now has been revealed by the appearing of our Savior, Christ Jesus, who has abolished death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel, for which I was appointed a preacher, an apostle, and a teacher. For this reason I also suffer these things, but I am not ashamed, for I know whom I have believed. And I am convinced he is able to guard what I have entrusted to him until that day. Retain the standard of sound words which you have heard from me and the faith and love which are in Christ Jesus. Guard through the Holy Spirit who dwells in us the treasure which has been entrusted to you. You know, I just, I, I really appreciate the Apostle Paul. 
The more I walk with the Lord, the more I see, you know, what Paul went through, the trials and tribulations he went through. And, and I can identify with some of them, not, not all of them. I mean, he's, he went through incredible persecution, but some of the things he's went through, and, and I just constantly find myself going back and saying, okay, Lord, how do I deal with this situation? How do I deal with this situation? One time I had to confront a, a pastor in Vietnam for some things that were going on, and, and I was like, Lord, how do I talk to this man? And I saw about how in Scripture, you know, Paul said, he said, treat the older men as fathers in the faith. And so I went to this man in humility as a father in the faith, and I said, Pastor, can I share something with you? And and I was able to do it in humility as a son to his father, and that man received the truth. And I was so grateful for that. But I find myself going back to Scripture and all the time and saying, Lord, how do I deal with this situation? What did, what did Paul do in this situation? How did Jesus deal with this? And, and I believe it's so important that we be in the Word on a daily basis, that we let the Word of God wash us and renew our minds and, and do things the way God says to do them, not the way the world says to do them, but to, to work situations and situations out, or circumstances the way God wanted us to do it. So moving back to... Um, Verse 5, he says, I am mindful of sincere faith within you, which first dwelt in your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice, and I'm sure is in you as well. You know, sometimes in America we think about our inheritance, and we're so concerned about storing all this stuff up so we can give it to our kids or our grandkids. But I see the greatest thing you can give your kids and your grandkids is an example of a life of faith and trust in Jesus Christ. That's the greatest gift you can give them. Material things and money will all pass away. But if you show them the example of Jesus Christ, that you're a praying person, you're a person of the word, you're a person that that loves Jesus Christ, that's the greatest example you can be. I was sharing with one lady this morning and how important her prayers are. And we need the prayers of the older saints. The younger generation doesn't know how to pray yet. You know, and the older saints, you know, when you get older, you've raised your kids and your grandkids. You don't really want anything in this world. All that matters is to see your kids and your grandkids follow in the ways of the Lord. And so we need the older saints to show the younger saints how to walk with Jesus, how to pray, and how to trust God. I remember uh, there was an older lady in Casper that I knew, and she was, her name was Margaret, and she was an amazing lady. But she trusted God. She walked with God for many, many years. And when I would get in tough situations, I'd call Margaret. I'd say, Margaret, can you please pray with me? I don't know what to do in this situation. And I remember uh, years ago I was in Turkey, and I saw all these Syrian refugees in, on the TV, and they were uh, they had a big snowstorm, and their tents were collapsing in these refugee camps. And these people were walking through mud puddles and through, through snow with flip-flops on. And I said, Lord, I want to help these people. And so I came back to the States, and a couple weeks later, this guy said, hey, do you want to buy 10,000 pairs of shoes? And I'm like, 10,000 pairs of shoes? I'm like, okay. And he said, it's $60,000. So I called up Margaret, and I said, hey, Margaret, I got an opportunity to buy 10,000 pairs of shoes. She says, buy them. God's in this. I said, Margaret, you haven't even prayed about it. She's, God's in this. I know God's in it. And I said, Margaret, you haven't even prayed about it. She said, Pat, God is in it. Buy the 10,000 pairs of shoes. I said, well, Margaret, it's going to cost me $60,000. I've never had to raise $60,000 for shoes before. She said, it's okay. God will take care of it. Now, here's a lady who's walked with Jesus many, many years, and she's not afraid to trust God. And I said, okay. And I said, now, Margaret, I don't have the faith to believe, but I'll agree with you. You pray, and I'll agree with you. And she said, okay, Lord, we need need $60,000 for 10,000 pairs of shoes. And she said, okay, it's done. Don't worry. Well, I see the checking account, and I'm like, easy for you to say. (laughs) I'm the one that has to pay the bills. And so, you know what? God brought the $60,000. And I called this pastor in Jordan, working the refugees. I said, Pastor, I want to send you a 40-foot container of supplies. What do you need? He said, I need new shoes. Do you have any new shoes? I said, I just bought 10,000 pairs of shoes. They're on the way. And so God knew, but it's like we need the older saints. We need the older saints to help us to be grounded in the word and and to be examples to us. So the greatest thing you can give to your kids and your grandkids is a godly life, 
A person that loves Jesus, that prays, that are on their knees, that spends time in the Word and lives out their Christian faith. Husbands loving his wife and a wife loving her husband and loving their kids and, and being people of faith. That's the greatest gift you can give them. And that's what Paul is saying to Timothy. He says in verse 6, he says, For this reason I remind you to kindle afresh the gift of God which is in you through the laying on of my hands. Now, I don't know about you, but sometimes I can get a little bit lax on my gifts. You know, yesterday I'm at, I'm at uh, Flying J, and I carry gospel tracts in my car, and I try to have them with me when I'm walking around just asking the Lord, Lord, who should I give this to? And, and sometimes I get kind of lazy. And sometimes I'm a, I don't I don't share like the gospel like I need to, and I'm like Lord, stir me up, stir me up, keep me keep me going. And so yesterday, talking to that young lady was just like a boost. Like Pat, you need to do this more often. You know, I'm preparing people. I got people that are searching. I'm going to set them up and and have you cross paths with these people. And so I need to be stirring up those gifts that God has placed within me, and we all need to do that. It's easy to kick back and relax. And, oh, well, I'll witness that person across the street. You know, I'll, I'll go share the gospel with them next week or next month. And, and next thing you know, we, they passed away. And we're like, wow, Lord, forgive me for my, my laziness or my complacency. And so we have to kindle afresh those gifts that God has placed within us. He says, because God has not given us a spirit of fear or timidity, but a power of love and discipline. We don't need to be afraid of the things of the world. We don't need to live in fear. The world lives, needs to live in fear because they don't know Jesus. They don't know we're going to spend eternity. But we know we're going to heaven. Years ago, we had a girl working in our office, and because of Ebola came out and, and ISIS, she came in one day, she says, I need to quit. I said, Why? She says, my mom and dad said, it's too dangerous to travel around the world anymore, so um, I need to quit. I can't work here anymore. And I said, okay, so is the Great Commission now uh, null and void because there's diseases in the world or there's terrorism in the world? No, we keep going. We keep going, and we don't need to live in fear like the world does. We don't need to live in fear of COVID. We need to be wise, but we don't need to live in fear of these things because God has numbered our days. Amen? Amen? We don't need to fear what the world fears. But we need to, to trust God and that God will bring us through these things. So then he says in verse 8, Therefore do not be ashamed of the testimony of our Lord or me, his prisoner, but join with me in suffering for the gospel according to the power of God. And I think if the persecuted church could say something to the American church, they would say, do not be ashamed of the testimony of Jesus Christ. But join with us in suffering for the gospel. Don't compromise the word of God. Don't give in to the world's demands. But stand with us and join with us in suffering. There's something that happens when we suffer for our Lord and Savior. I think we kind of understand a little bit more what Jesus went through for us when we suffer. When life is just easy and everything's comfortable, you know, it's nice. Oh, yeah, Jesus died on the cross for me. He suffered. He went through all those things. That's nice. But when we start being ridiculed and we start being mocked, all of a sudden we appreciate Jesus a whole lot more. And I think in America, sometimes it's, it's easy to take the cross for granted. It's easy to just think, oh, well, you know, I, I live in America. We'll never be persecuted here. We'll never have a time when the Bibles are taken away. I believe it's becoming more, or more obvious. People in leadership now hate God. They hate God, and they're not afraid to say it. They're not afraid to say it. They're trying to redefine everything that God has put in his word. They're trying to go against everything. Redefine marriage, redefine gender, redefine everything according to what they want it to be. Or what the UN is telling them. I heard that, that people now in the world, they don't believe the Bible, but they believe their human rights come from the United Nations. And that's scary when you think about it. If you get your human rights from what a group of people in, in Europe are telling you what the, the human rights are, that's scary. I'm so grateful for the word of God. But we need to stand up for Jesus Christ and not compromise the word. 
And even if it means we, we get persecuted for it, we may lose our jobs, we may not be able to go to university, we may not to do the things that everybody else can do, but we need to stand up because God will reward his people for that stand up for righteousness. He will reward them one way or another. He will. And he says he saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was granted us in Christ Jesus from all eternity. But as now is revealed by the appearing of our Savior, Christ Jesus, who has abolished death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel, for which I was appointed a preacher, an apostle, and a teacher. So Paul was called. He was called and he was anointed to do the things he did. But he also had a cross to bear. And I believe as Christians, when we put our faith and trust in Jesus, we will be hated by this world because this world is opposed to God in his ways. And so as Christians, we need to count the cost. Say, am I willing to put my life on the line or risk imprisonment or death even for the cause of Christ? Because it may be coming to this country. I believe it is coming. But I believe that, it, you know, the, the things are changing in, in the government. They're changing things. And we need to stand firm on the word of God. But be willing to say, you know what, Jesus, I'm going to stand for you. I know a pastor in Turkey, and he actually, his best friend was an Olympic wrestler and won uh, some medals. And the guy came to faith, and then he led this pastor, the Lord, who later became a pastor. And he said one day they came and they arrested all the Christians. And he said, my friend was arrested, and I was arrested. And they took my friend into this room, and they beat him and they, with a metal rod. They hit, started hitting him and said, deny your faith in Jesus Christ and say that Islam's the truth. He said, no, Islam's a lie. Jesus is the truth. So they beat him some more. And they say, okay, now deny your faith in Jesus and, and say Islam's the truth. He said, no, no, Islam's a lie. Jesus is the truth. And they beat him so bad that he finally passed out. And so this man who becomes a pastor hears this in the next room, and he said, everything in me wanted to deny my faith in Jesus Christ, everything. He said, they took me in that room, and they hit me with this metal rod, and they broke his hand. And they said, now renounce your faith in Jesus Christ and say Islam's the truth. He said, the Spirit of God rose up on me, and he said, no. He said, Islam's a lie. Jesus is the truth. He said, everything in me all of a sudden wanted to stand for Jesus no matter what. And he said, they just kept beating me and kept beating me and telling me to renounce Jesus. And he said, no, I will not. He said, Jesus is my Lord and my Savior. He died on the cross for me, and I will never deny him. And he said, that's the kind of faith we have to have in our country because when you come to faith in Jesus Christ in Turkey, your life, your target automatically. In Iran, you come to faith and and your life is you know on the line. And so they see these radical Christians and, and that's what impacts the world because they see these people Christianity's real. You know, for one thing, for Islam, they're willing to kill for their faith. Very few of them are willing to die for their faith. But when they see Christians that love Jesus Christ and love the word of God and will not compromise, that is speaking to Muslims around the world. And they're seeing the compassion of Christians and saying, you're different. You're different. You're not looking to see what you can get from me, but you're willing to share what you have with me. And it's a witness to them. So Paul says, for this reason I also suffer these things, but I am not ashamed For I know whom I have believed and am convinced he's able to guard what I've entrusted to him until that day. And we need to be willing to suffer and not be ashamed because we know what we believed and we're convinced that God's word is absolutely true. We have to be totally convinced and ask God to put that kind of conviction in us, that kind of faith in us that we will love Jesus no matter what. I was talking to a young man from, from Lebanon, and actually in Lebanon, he was from Syria. And he was a new believer, and he was reading the Bible. And, and I was telling him stories like I was telling you this morning about pastors in China that spent over 20 years in prison for their faith and believers that were struggling in their faith around the world but stood firm for Jesus. He said, I have a question for you. I said, what's that? He said, when ISIS comes to our door, can I deny that I know Jesus Christ to save my life? And when they leave, then repent and go on with God. 
I said, I don't see that in the word. Jesus said, if you confess me before men, I'll confess you before my Father in heaven. You deny me before men, I'll deny you before my Father in heaven. And I said, we need to pray that God would give us the grace to walk through no matter what. I said, if they kill us, we're going to heaven. We're going to be with Jesus forever. There was a young man that I met in Nepal years ago. His name was Kisor. Kisor was, was a Christian in his village. There was only, there was 400 people in the village. He was the only Christian out of 400 people in that village. His father was a witch doctor. There was a big festival one day. They were drinking and, and using drugs and everything else. And the father's a witch doctor. He calls up his son Kisor in front of all the people in the village. And said, son, bow down and worship and kiss the idol. He said, dad, I can't worship that idol. It's not the true God. It's a lie. And he said, son, bow down and worship the idol now. He said, dad, I will never bow down and kiss that idol. There's only one true God. And he lives in heaven. And his son is Jesus Christ. His dad went and got a very sharp knife. They call it a kokiri. Went and put it to his son's neck, his throat right here. And drew back and was ready to chop his son's head off in front of 400 people. And he's getting ready to chop his head off. And I asked Kisor, I said, what were you thinking at that point when your dad had that knife at your throat? He said, I knew I was going to be with Jesus in seconds. I knew it. So his father draws back, is ready to chop his son's head off. The grandfather steps in, grabs his son's hand and said, don't kill your son. Don't kill your son. And the father said to his son, get out of the village. Don't ever come back. Now in Nepal, your your village is like your extended family, like aunts and uncles. They're everybody to you, you know. And so for that young man to have to leave the village at 17 years old is like leaving everything. And I said, what were you thinking when you turned around and walked out of that village? He said that the song came to mind, I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back, no turning back. That young 17-year-old young man refused to bow his knee to that idol and kiss that idol, even though it could have cost him his life. When I sing that song now, I have decided to follow Jesus. Man, it, it touches my heart because I think of Kisor. Kisor went on to get medical training and by the grace of God, he's been allowed to go back to his village. He's put a, he set up a little medical clinic and a little pharmacy. His brother and his sister have come to faith. And he's praying that his whole village will come to faith in Jesus Christ. I mean, the testimony of a 17-year-old young man that refused to bow his knee, even though it could have cost his life. But he knew, he said, I, I knew I was going to be with, with Jesus in seconds. And so we have to be that convinced in our hearts that the gospel is true, that Jesus is the world's only hope. It's hard for me to come back to America sometimes when I hear about, they say like 67% of evangelical Christians in America don't believe that Jesus is the only way to God. That breaks my heart. I'm like, here we are trying to get the Bible to people around the world that are willing to die for their faith, and we're not convinced in our own country? What is wrong with us? But it's because people are not in the Word of God. They're not in the Word. They're not in prayer. We're too too busy being entertained by the TV. And it's like we we don't know the Word. But we need to put the Word in our hearts and and hide God's Word in our hearts, memorize God's Word in our heart, memorize and, and renew our minds with the Word on a daily basis. He says, retain the standard of sound words which you've heard from me in the faith and love which are in Christ Jesus. Thank God for Pastor Darrell. Thank God for him that he's boldly preaching the gospel, teaching the word of God on a a weekly basis. He keeps preaching the word and doesn't compromise the word. He's giving you the word. He's, He's not the norm. He is not the norm in this country. Thank God for a man that's willing to stand up for the truth. Thank you, Pastor. Thank you. You guys are blessed to have a pastor that's teaching the Word of God, teaching through the Bible. You know, praise God. Instead of hearing some nice message about McDonald's or you shouldn't go to McDonald's because they put, produce too much trash. It's like, you know, thank God you're hearing the Word of God. You're hearing the counsel, the whole counsel of God. And that's what we need to hear because the Word feeds us. And we need to be in the Word on a daily basis. 
What if, what if they shut down the church in a couple of years? What if they arrested Pastor Daryl? Are you going to fall away as a Christian because you don't know the word anymore? That's why it's important for us to be in the word on a daily basis. So we know what the word says. We're feeding on, spending time with Jesus in the word and prayer so that we're growing in our faith and that we can do the work God has called us to do. So he says, guard through the Holy Spirit, which dwells, which dwells in us, the treasure which has been entrusted to you. And I believe that we as believers have been entrusted with the greatest treasure in the whole world. The gospel of Jesus Christ is the greatest treasure in the whole world. And we want to, re- we want to guard that. We don't want the world to creep in. We don't want false teaching to creep in. We don't want to be deceived by the, by the ways of this world, but we want to spend time in the Word, but we want to share that, that truth with others. When I was sharing with that girl last night, Phoenix, I can't tell you what a joy it was to see God touching this girl, 24-year-old girl, and tell me how she's addicted to drugs. And I told her that Jesus is the way out. Jesus is the way out of that addiction. Turn your life to Jesus Christ. I pray that even tonight, before you close your eyes, that you will surrender your heart and life to Jesus Christ. This girl just sat there, tears just streaming down her face. And I thought, thank you, Lord, that I can offer her hope. There's no hope outside of Jesus Christ. There's no life outside of Jesus Christ. If, if you're without faith and trust in Jesus Christ, you survive. You're in survival mode. But when you know Jesus Christ, he wants to give you eternal life and abundant life. Life. And that life comes through knowing him and walking in obedience to him. That's life, and it it keeps us going and encourages us day by day. So I just want to encourage you that, you know, we have been blessed. We have been blessed as believers in this country. We've been blessed that we've had freedom to be able to worship and to hear the word of God preached. But we don't want to take that for granted. And we need to use opportunities to share the gospel with people around us. Because no matter what the facade is, in America we're good at wearing masks. I think that's why COVID's worked so well, because people can just put another mask on top of their other mask. you know. <laughs> but God wants us to look beyond the mask and see what's going on. Because people's lives, they're falling apart. People are searching. I mean, more and more young people are, are, are looking to suicide. People are turning to drugs and alcohol and all these other things because they're empty inside and they need the truth of Jesus Christ. Amen? Let's pray. Father, I just thank you for this day. I thank you for Pastor Darrell. I thank you for a man that will not compromise the word. That, Lord, he faithfully preaches your word. I thank you for this church and their heart for missions, Father. I thank you that, Lord, they love the word of God and they want to see your word go all over the world. That people everywhere can hear the truth of Jesus Christ. And so, Father, I pray that you would stir up in each one of us. Stir up a love for Jesus Christ. That, Lord, that we would so love with Jesus with everything that's in us. That we would love the word of God. That we would spend time in prayer. Because, Lord, our only hope for this nation, as long and with all the nations of the earth, is Jesus Christ. The only hope for Cuba, Pakistan, Laos, Burma, it's, the only hope is Jesus Christ. And so, Father, we pray for a revival to break out in this nation. We pray that people would turn to you, no matter how dark it gets, that people would see the light of Jesus Christ, that you would shine through your church. And so I just ask you to bless each one now. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. Thank you. God bless you.